Picture it. It's 2011, and South Park just released their episode titled Asperger's, where Cartman mishears Stan's potential diagnosis of Asperger's and opens up a food stand where the special ingredient is that he stuffs the burgers in his pants next to his ass, thus creating his own Asperger's. I got vaccinated from the school, and now clearly I have Asperger's. Very funny. Well, I'm glad you think Asperger's is funny. You, being the only person in your class openly diagnosed with autism at the time, have to deal with the relentless questions from your edgelord classmates asking, <laughs> Where are the burgers for your ass? <laughs> And maybe because you don't watch South Park, or maybe because you just take everything a little too literally, you don't get the joke, and everyone laughs. You're aware that they're laughing at you, but you don't know why, and so it becomes a horrible memory that scars you for life, and years later, even after getting the admittedly funny joke, you still cringe whenever you think of the memory, because as a young, impressionable teenager, it led you to believe that you're always going to be the butt of the joke. <laughs> A lot of autistic people, especially those of us who grew up in the early 2000s, have memories like that. Especially when it comes to those of us who were originally diagnosed with Asperger's Syndrome like I was in 2011. A diagnosis I no longer identify with because of the very long and problematic history involved. And when I mention that I don't like the term Asperger's due to the long and problematic history of it, I often get questions like, why don't you like the term? Or, have you tried reclaiming it? Or, hey, you remember that time in high school where I asked you where the burgers were for your ass? That was funny. <laughs> and when I get these questions, I'm shocked to find out how little people know about why the term Asperger's is so harmful to the autism community as a whole. So I figure, why not get into to it. Before we begin, as always, let's lay some groundwork. You don't have to give up your label of Asperger's. Honestly, you don't. I don't have any legal authority to take it away from you. I could use my cat's government connections to make a law, but that could take years and honestly she's not speaking to me right now. So if you hear all of the history of the problematic nature of the term and you're still wanting to identify with it, you have that choice. But that doesn't mean myself or others have to engage with you. The boundaries that I set with people who use this term are for my psychological and emotional protection, and I choose not to engage or interact with people who use that term. If that upsets you, I'm sorry, but those are my boundaries, and if those are the boundaries of other autistic people, you have no right to tell them they are wrong. You are not entitled to other people's friendship, time, or energy. Now, with that said, let's dive into the problematic nature of Hans Asperger and the term Asperger syndrome. If we are going to talk about the problematic nature of the term, we might as well talk about the man himself. Hans Asperger. What's wrong with him? Well... The term autistic was first used in the early 1910s by Swiss psychologist Eugen Bleuler to describe social withdrawal and detachment from reality seen in children diagnosed with schizophrenia. A decade later in 1924, a 12-year-old child with severe social withdrawal from his peers, severe anxiety, and stomach aches was brought into a clinic in Moscow where he was examined by a gifted young Jewish clinician, Granya Efimovna Sukareva, where she described him as an introverted type with an autistic proclivity into himself. Over the next year, she identified six more children with autistic tendencies and in 1925 published a paper of her discoveries of these autistic tendencies, detailing them in ways that many modern psychologists have translated to be basic descriptions of current DSM-5 criteria for autism. Ten years before Leo Kanner, who is also problematic in his own right, or Hans Asperger wrote either of their papers, which are thought to be the first clinical descriptions of autism. Though Sukareva has relative obscurity here in the West, in Russia she is thought to be the mother of child psychology, especially given her publishing of over 150 different papers on all sorts of disorders, including intellectual disability, schizophrenia, dissociative identity disorder, and many other conditions. Oh my god! Wow! Though Hans Asperger was not from Russia, it is very likely, given the sheer amount of papers she published, that he read her work, yet he chose not to cite it within his own research of autistic people. But, you know what, L let's give old Hansi the benefit of the doubt and say that he just never heard of Sukareva, given that she was, of course, in Moscow, and he himself was in Austria. Well... 
Around the same time Sukareva was publishing her own papers describing autism, two Jewish doctors in Vienna, Georg Frankel and Annie Weiss, were writing their own papers describing autistic traits within children, two decades prior to Hans Asperger writing his famous paper about autism. In the early 1930s, Frankel and Weiss wrote multiple papers about the children in their clinics who were socially withdrawn but suffered from a disconnect between facial expressions, body language, and speech. When Frankel became the head of that clinic in 1932, guess who came along to train under Frankel and worked with Weiss? None other than Rocky Balboa himself, Sylvester Stallone. No, I'm kidding. It was Hans Osberger. Shortly after his training, Hitler rose to power and the Nazi regime began their directive of ousting all Jewish doctors. Annie Weiss, who spoke English, fled to America where she enlisted the help of Leo Kanner, who was also Jewish, to get more than 200 Jewish doctors and clinicians to escape from Europe. Fun fact, Weiss and Frankel were married six days after they reunited in America, so I guess this was a love story after all. Years after Weiss and Frankel fled Vienna, Hans Osberger released his own papers about autism, citing neither Weiss nor Frankel. Hans Osberger never originated any of his work on autism. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. He stood off the backs of other people and took credit for what they achieved and discovered, and in my opinion, it's likely because he thought history would not remember the previous clinicians because of the fact that they were Jewish. Why do I say that? Well... Let me start off by saying that no, Hans Osberger was never an official member of the Nazi party. He was just a clinician in Vienna where the Nazis took over completely. Because of the fact that he never officially joined the Nazi party, it's led to this increasing narrative that he was somehow an opponent of the Nazis and that he hated everything they did and actively worked against them to sabotage them like some Batman-esque hero of World War II. I swear to God. Swear to me. Ah! Sorry to burst your bubble, kids, but Hans Osberger was a complacent player in the Nazi regime. Not only was he a card-carrying member of Austria's fascist party before the Nazis took over, according to historian Erwig Scheck, Osberger successfully sought to accommodate himself to the Nazi regime and was rewarded with career opportunities in return. You got rich doing business with the Nazis during the Holocaust. This is a part of a broader effort by historians to expose what doctors were doing during the Third Reich. This study, accompanied by an editorial from autism expert from Cambridge University, Simon Baron Cohen, who, yes, is cousins with Sasha Baron Cohen. He is barely my assholes. And Joseph Bobom of Mount Sinai University, this study brought to light instances where Hans Osberger participated in the Third Reich's childhood euthanasia program, believing that these children, many of whom had severe intellectual disabilities, were burdens who were not worthy of life. Many of those children, after being euthanized, had their deaths falsely recorded as dying of pneumonia. Whether you like it or not, this is the history of Hans Osberger. It doesn't matter that he was never an official member of the Nazi party. All of his work was in service to it, and he took the benefits that the Nazis gave him over the sacrifice of his Jewish colleagues, whom he conveniently left out of his citations. We were friends. I could have helped them. But the Nazis paid too well. And given the fact that he was such an active player in the Nazi game, I'm left to believe that he was a willing participant because he thought the Nazis were going to win in the end. Hans Osberger was an unoriginal Nazi sympathizer who will unfortunately never be forgotten by history because... Despite popular belief, the term Osberger syndrome was not actually coined by Hans Osberger to describe low support needs autistic people. He actually referred to them as little Einsteins in reference to Jewish scientist Albert Einstein, who was widely believed to have been on the autism spectrum. The term Osberger syndrome was a term that was coined by Lorna Wing in 1976, which was then widely popularized when she published it in a 1981 paper describing several children she had been studying who met the symptoms described 
described by Hans Osberger in his research. In 1992, the term was added to the IDC-10, the diagnostic tool used in countries such as Australia, France, Germany, Denmark, China, and many others. And then in 1994, the term was added to the DSM, the diagnostic tool used here in the United States of America. There were multiple problems with this, the first being that a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome excluded the possibility of an ADHD diagnosis, meaning that many people had to choose whether or not they could be diagnosed with autism or ADHD, and the second being that it put an unnecessary divisory line between autism and Asperger's, despite Asperger's being a form of autism. The term was removed from the DSM in 2013 not because of the history of Hans Osberger or his legacy, but because the diagnostic distinction was completely arbitrary and based solely off of the opinion of the clinician and their perception of autism. Basically, you would have a lot of situations like this. Hi, I'd like to get a diagnosis, please. Okay, what are your symptoms? Well, I struggle with eye contact, uh, sensory processing, and I can't understand social cues. Well, that sounds like Asperger's to me. Yes, this is an oversimplified version of an autism assessment. I'm just using it as an example, so shut up. Hi, I'm the same person. I'd like to get a diagnosis, please. Okay, what are your symptoms? Well, I struggle with eye contact, sensory processing, and I can't understand social cues. Well, that sounds like autism to me. You see, the problem here is that the diagnosis of Asperger's and autism was just completely arbitrary. The same person could get a wildly different diagnosis depending on what clinician they went to. And because of that arbitrary distinction between Asperger's and autism, it led to a lot of people thinking that Asperger's was somehow the better version of autism, which led to a much bigger problem within the community, Aspie supremacy. Aspie supremacy is the idea that those with Asperger's syndrome have some sort of innate ability to make them superior to not only other autistic people, but the rest of the population as well. This is where the idea behind the whole autism superpower comes from, or the theory that all autistic people are geniuses. It comes from Aspie supremacy. And yes, before it's brought up, I am not immune to this either. Being this light on the spectrum basically means that I get all of the sensory troubles of autism without any of the superpowers. Superpowers. That's awesome. Like many autistic people, I myself have dipped into Aspie supremacy rhetoric here and there, because it's really easy to fall into the Aspie supremacy pipeline, especially when you've been isolated for long periods of time from your peers, or suffered severe bullying, or when you've grown up always feeling like you're less than everyone else. Of course it's easy to attach to the idea that my autism doesn't make me less than, it makes me better. But the truth is, I'm not better. None of us are. We are just autistic. And the biggest problem with the Aspie supremacy logic is that it actually completely leaves behind the most marginalized of our community, autistic people with high support needs. If autistic people with high support needs don't have the genius IQ or the special autism superpower, what purpose do they serve in society? And to that I say, the right to exist is not based on your purposes served in society. You don't have to contribute to the economy, you don't have to be a doctor, you don't have to be anything. You don't have to prove your worth on this planet. In the words of the 11th Doctor, You know, in 900 years of time and space, I've never met anyone who wasn't important before. The legacy of Aspie supremacy is one that still continues to harm the autism community to this day, whether it's through the logic of us being superior to non-autistic people or even other autistic people within our community. And it's something I think all people who continue to identify with the term Aspie should learn. Because when you choose to identify with the term, knowing the history, knowing the harm that it continues to uphold to other people, you are choosing to identify with a term that is based in Nazi ideology and eugenics. And that's not even me exaggerating, because legitimately people have advocated for the eradication of non-Asperger's autistic people on multiple occasions. There's a famous poem from post-World War II era of literature titled, First They Came. The poem reads, First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. This poem was written as an admission from the author Lutheran pastor Niemöller about his own complacency in the rise of Nazism in Germany, 
and it's as relevant today as it was then, especially when it comes to the autism community. When we don't uplift those most marginalized, when we don't advocate for diversity amongst our community, if we allow eugenics ideology to stay complacent and dormant within our community, it will eventually come to harm us as well. And when it does, there will be no one left to speak out for us. Hello, thank you for watching. This was one of the hardest videos I have ever made. If you would like to support my channel, please consider liking, subscribing, maybe leaving a comment down below. All of that helps the algorithm. And if you'd like to support the channel monetarily, I have my Patreon link down below, along with a merch link where you can buy some merch. We have a whole bunch of stuff like Autistic Bimbo, Autistic Himbo, and Autistic Thembo, because being beautiful and dumb as rocks has no gender. If you subscribe to my Patreon, we have multiple tiers where somewhere you can just interact with me for like $3 a month, or some as expensive as $300 a month, and no one has paid for that one yet, so I don't have to say anything nice about Autism Speaks. So there! I still don't, that's not as much of a dig as I think it is. If you do not have the funds to support the channel on Patreon, again, you can always just support the channel by liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. Aspie supremacy is a very big problem in the autism community, and it's one that we all should be aware of. If we do not know history, we are doomed to forever repeat it. And like I said before, you don't have to stop identifying with the term of Asperger's syndrome. It's up to you. But if you do, you should know whose name you are upholding, and you should know the rhetoric behind that name. Thank you all so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye!